Hi everyone, today I'll be talking about the problem of submodular maximization with a cardinality constraint in the streaming model. My name is Andrew Sa, and this work is joint authored by Noir Alalouf, Alina Ene, Moran Feldman, and Hui Lewen. I'll be presenting two algorithms that appear in our paper, along with the development of some of the ideas that went into them. As a quick outline, I'll be quickly going over some background on the topic so that you can better understand where in the literature this work falls. Um, then we'll, I'll go into some of the techniques and ideas used in the algorithms and attempt to build some intuition on the algorithms. Finally, we're going to put together those ideas into the actual algorithms themselves, the descriptions of them, as well as discuss what approximation guarantees they have. So what exactly is a submodular function? It's a real valued function over a discrete domain or ground set V. And we say that it's submodular if it satisfies what we call the diminishing returns property. This property is pretty intuitive. You can probably guess something about what it is from its name. Um, it just says that if we have two sets where one is contained within the other, then the gain in function value from adding a new element to the set will be larger for the smaller set. So on the defi definition you see on screen, the two sets are A and B, where A is the smaller one, A is contained in B, and the new element being considered is E. This concept of the change in function value um, by adding a new element is pretty important when talking about submodularity, so we'll be using this notation f of s bar t to denote the marginal gain of s onto t. More often than not, for this talk at least, we'll be talking about the marginal gain of adding a single item rather than an entire set, um, so just keep that in mind. Let's, get, let's take a quick look at a few examples of uh, some modular functions to hopefully help us distinguish between a certain property that some modular functions may or may not have that can make a very big difference and will be the key point of today. Our first example is that of coverage functions. Let's say that we have a bunch of discrete points, say on the plane, and our ground set will be sets of these discrete points or covers of points. So in the picture here, A and B are elements of our ground set, not the points themselves. Uh, our function f is just the number of points the union of sets covers. So for example, if we were to evaluate the function of A union B, it would be 12 because there are 12 points in total covered by A and B. Let's do a quick computation just to verify some modularity for a small example. Uh, let's say we add another set C into the picture. We want to verify that the marginal gain of adding this new element set C is smaller for larger sets than smaller ones. So if we look at the gain for A union B, we see that we only get two new points covered, so the marginal gain is two. If we look at the gain for just B, we see that we get three new points covered, so the marginal gain is three, which verifies the modularity for this part, uh, which, you, which makes sense because the larger set has fewer points that it can gain in the first place, right? The smaller set is completely contained in the larger one, so there's fewer points it can, a new set can cover at all, which is precisely what some modularity is describing. Now let's take a look at another example, this time cut functions and graphs. So we have some graph, and our ground set V is the vertex set of the graph. Our function is the number of edges cut by the bipartition formed from the input set and the rest of the vertices. Let's take a look at the marginal gains here of adding the marked vertex E to our input sets A and B. A is strictly smaller than B as you can see. If we take a look at the marginal gain of E on B, we see that we lose two edges and gain one edge, so we have a net loss of one edge. And if you look at the gain of E on A, we see that we gain two edges and lose one edge, giving us a net gain of one edge. This again shows that some modularity holds for this example, but it demonstrates a certain property difference between cut functions and coverage functions, one that is the primary focus of this talk. And that concept is monotonicity. We say that a function is monotone if adding a new element cannot hurt the function value. Um, so coverage is, is an example that we just saw of a monotone function, since if we add a new set, we cannot lose coverage. We can only stand to gain new coverage or not gain any at all. On the other hand, cut functions are non-monotone, since the marginal gain can be negative. As we go from the empty set to the entire vertex set as the input for the function, the function value will begin at zero, increase, and decrease back to zero, eventually showcasing non-monotonicity. Monotonicity seems to make a marked difference in the success of approximation algorithms in the literature, and our talk today will be about how, in a sense, it doesn't help us that much for our specific problem. So what exactly is our optimization problem? For our setup, suppose that we have a non-negative, potentially non-monotone submodular function, f, and a non-negative parameter, k, 
then our problem is of maximizing f subject to a size or cardinality constraint on the solution set. Uh, we're going to be focusing on this problem in the streaming model where data comes one by one by one over a data stream and we have limited memory to work with. As you might guess, this problem is MP hard in general, even if we are not streaming, even if we're not in the streaming model. So we're trying to obtain good approximation guarantees rather than solve it exactly. Uh, we have a data stream that is giving us data in an arbitrary order. In this case, the data appears to be letters and it's appearing in alphabetical order. Our current element is K, and every other element is inaccessible unless we store it for later use. So the letters E through J, have appeared already, but unless we decide to store them, they are gone and inaccessible. And we, and our algorithm doesn't see what's coming up in the future, L, M, N, O, P, but it's just there for us to see. The memory that we're gonna be working with is polynomial in K and one over epsilon. Where epsilon is an error parameter that we can use for the algorithm. Um, we're considering generally very large data sets since it's the streaming model, so we can't really store very much just polynomial and our feasible solution size and the error term. So with our working memory and the current element of the stream, um, we put together this information in some way to compute whether or not we want to store the element for later use. You know, decide if we're gonna keep it, if it's gonna be in a solution, if it's worth for later consideration, or if we're just gonna throw it away. Now to do the computation of whether or not we're gonna keep it or not, um, usually we assume that we have value oracle access to f, so we can evaluate the function f on any sets that we have, any sets of elements that we have access to. Um, and more importantly, that allows us to compute the marginal gain of an element as well. And once we do that and any other potential computations we may need, we can move on to the next element, essentially forgetting our element k existed unless we decide to store it for later use. To get a bit more depth into the difficulty of the problem and the current state of literature, let's see what we know for approximation guarantees and inapproximability results in this setting. So for monotone functions, we have a simple algorithm that achieves a near half approximation. And this is in fact nearly optimal since no algorithm can do better than a half. Um, this result applies both for monotone functions and non-monotone functions. So we can't do better than a half in non-monotone either. Uh, prior to our work, the best known approximation for this problem is about 0.1715, and our work focuses on this lower bound and shows that in some sense, we can achieve near optimal approximation guarantees for the non monotone problem as well. Um, there is still some room left to be done there, but in a certain sense, monotonicity doesn't make a big deal for this problem. With that, let's move on to developing the ideas that we'll be using in the actual algorithms themselves. Now, our first idea is one that proves to be very useful in the monotone setting that we'll be adapting for our use, which we call thresholding. In the offline setting, the greedy algorithm where we just select the elements with the best marginal gain at each step works pretty well for the problem. Um, however, we can't do that in the streaming setting, so let's lower the bar a bit. Rather than selecting optimally the best greedy elements possible, let's select elements whose marginal gains are good enough, in quote unquote where an element is good enough if its marginal gain is at least the threshold. But how do we determine that threshold? Well, we know from previous results that we can reasonably estimate the optimal value of the problem f of opt. Now, does this help us? In the monotone setting, it helps us quite a bit, actually, and it'll help us for the non-monotone case as well. In the monotone case, we know that there is an optimal solution with k elements, since adding an element can't hurt us, right? So there's no reason to just fill up the budget completely. If we divide by k, we get that f of opt over k is a sort of av the average marginal gain or marginal contribution in opt. And this gives us a nice grounded benchmark to work with for the threshold. Ideally, we'd like to select elements of marginal gains at least as good as the average. At least that's the intuition that we have. But that's a bit too optimistic, right? Because it's not even guaranteed that all of the elements of opt will have higher than average marginal gains, let alone the actual stream order that can definitely mess things up based on the order the elements arrive in. So let's relax our hopes a bit. And instead of taking this quantity f of opt over k flat, we can instead take a proportion of it instead, say by multiplying it by some fractional constant c. This way, if our solution fills up, then 
we've constructed our solution by making sure the marginal gains are at least a certain threshold. So, and we're adding k of them. So our final solution value has value at least c times f of opt in this manner. This means that in this case, we've achieved a c approximation of the optimal value. But the setting of c needs to be done carefully because if, it's, if the threshold is too low, then while we can almost assuredly uh, get our solution to be full, it doesn't do as much good if the solution is full of worthless elements, right? Low value elements. Um, on the other hand, if the, if the threshold is too high, then we risk not filling the solution enough. And the, the items that we rejected, we can't say much about that either because the threshold was too high. So it's a kind of a balancing act that, there that we're working with. Now, the thresholding idea works very well for monotone functions, but it doesn't work nearly as well by itself for non-monotone functions. And there's a pretty simple counterexample to show why that is. Um, so consider the following function f. Our elements consist of two different types of apples, regular apples, which are red, and, and a poisoned apple, which is purple. There's only one poisoned apple, but we have an abundance of regular red apples. So if the poisoned apple is present in our solution, then the function value is a constant four. But if the poisoned apple is not present, then the function value is just the size of our set. This function is still submodular, which you can verify pretty easily, but it tricks many algorithms for monotone functions because the initial marginal gain of the poisoned apple is large, but having it spoils the function value for all other apples, right? The poison apple can appear at the very beginning of the stream, and due to the way the information flows in the data stream, we can't really distinguish this as being a good element or a good element with a high, draw high drawback. So how can we deal with this problem? Well, as the old expression goes, one bad apple can spoil the entire barrel, right? But if that's the case, then a simple idea works. Why not just maintain multiple barrels to limit the damage that that bad apple can cause. This idea of maintaining multiple barrels or multiple buckets, we call this idea partitioning. And it borrows some ideas from our previous work in the distributed setting. The idea itself is pretty simple. We'll maintain multiple solution sets, say M of them. And when an apple comes along, it will be considered for one of the solution sets, thereby partitioning the ground set. Um, thinking about it in the poison apple example, when the poison apple comes along, only one of the n barrels will be affected, and the rest will work as normal. We may have introduced this idea relative to the poison apple example, but the idea actually generalizes quite well for other non-monotone functions. The idea here being that if we handle with care uh, m different solutions, then we can lose at most 1 over m of the optimal value due to non-monotonicity. So we have the idea of partitioning that we're going to be using primarily to combat the non-monotonicity of the function. Um, but how do we actually implement it? How do we put it into practice? The two algorithms that we're working up to with all, this, um, all these ideas differ primarily on how this partitioning idea is used and in what form. The first idea is to use randomness to form the partition. So each solution set has a 1 over m probability of getting an element to consider. And the other idea is to take items fractionally rather than integrally. And you may be asking, how do we take an item fractionally? We have a discrete set, we have a discrete function. Well, as it turns out, there are some very useful continuous extensions in the context of some modularity. And using these extensions, we can pick items fractionally, um, say of size 1 over m, based on if the marginal gain in that extension meets the threshold requirement. For our problem specifically, there are some very nice rounding techniques that, that are called swap rounding and pipage rounding that allow us to round our solution without losing function value for the right choice of extensions. Um, so this is something that we can do after the data stream ends. Once the data stream ends and we have our fractional solution, we can just round them using these techniques and we'll get an integral solution without really any loss of value for the choice of extension that we use. This rounding procedure leads us into the last primary idea of the algorithms, and that is post-processing our data after the stream is ended. So far, we have this part of the process, where we partition a data stream in some manner, whether that be through randomness or fractional items, 
then we prune the data we want to store based on a well-chosen threshold. Now let's consider our options on what we can do after the stream ends to take our M solutions and obtain the good value feasible final solution S because we have multiple solutions, they may be feasible individually, but putting them together is certainly not going to be feasible, nor, will, nor may it have good value in the non-monotone setting. Our first idea is to run a polynomial time offline algorithm on the elements that we've stored by the end. This is what you'd need to do if not just our data stream is large, but our cardinality parameter k was large as well, right? But if our data stream is large and our cardinality parameter is relatively small, then we have another option. It may be possible to do some kind of heuristic exponential search to find the best solution. So we're finding the best approximate solution out of these, this subset of elements that we have. The difference between these two options is what the optimality of our algorithms ends up being, um, whether we can do exponential post-processing or it has to be strictly polynomial time post-processing. Finally, as we discussed beforehand, if we, did, if we did use a continuous method to pick items fractionally, we can round here as well in order to give us an integral solution and not a fractional solution. That wraps up the last of the main ideas we'll be needing to describe our algorithms. So how about now we take the time to put together those ideas and describe what our algorithms are doing precisely. So our first algorithm is a combinatorial algorithm that uses random partitioning. The algorithm itself takes in a few parameters. F is our submodular function, K is our cardinality parameter, epsilon is our error parameter. Those are pretty standard for, from what we've been doing so far. And kappa is going to be our threshold. First, we'll need to initialize a few variables. So for this first algorithm, we'll actually need to repeat the algorithm of, um, of partitioning and thresholding multiple times in parallel. And that's what this variable r is representing. We, we need to do this to boost the probabilities of certain events in the analysis. The actual quantity isn't too important for our intuition of what the algorithm is. So just know that it's going to be on the order of natural log of 1 over epsilon over epsilon. As for the number of buckets, we'll pick one over epsilon as the number of buckets. Why? This should be this should follow pretty well from our example of apples and barrels from before. The idea is that if we have n different solutions, then the loss from non-monotonicity non can affect this by at most a factor of one over m. So if we set the number of buckets to one over epsilon, then it can, the loss is at most a factor of epsilon. With that set up out of the way, We'll be doing the following for each arriving element in the data stream. So we're now in the streaming portion of the algorithm. Um, and so we're going to be doing this for both, for both each arriving element and each parallel repetition. So for each element, we're going to pick one of the n buckets uniformly and independently at random. Then we're going to check to see if the marginal gain of adding that element to the bucket both fits and exceeds the threshold. So if the marginal gain of adding e to s sub i j is greater than or equal to the threshold kappa, and we also need to make sure that it fits, so its cardinality s sub i j is at most k. If it does, then we can add it, and if it doesn't, we reject the element. Now, once the data stream ends, we get to the post-processing section of the algorithm, if any of the buckets have reached capacity, we can just return it, since we chose our threshold in such a way that the marginal gains were good, right? It, the, the event that a bucket becomes full should be a good event. If this doesn't happen, then we can run some offline algorithm on the elements that we've stored and return the max between that solution and any of the buckets. We just picked S11 here for convenience and how the analysis plays out, but in reality, you'd probably do something like return the best of the buckets and t. The actual bucket that we're comparing it to doesn't matter as far as the guarantee goes. Our second algorithm is a continuous extension-based algorithm that, rather than constructing a random partition, instead takes items fractionally. While they can seem different, they end up having similar effects despite the second algorithm appearing a bit more compact, as you can tell from the bounding box of the algorithm. The parameters that our algorithm takes here are largely the same as what we did in the first one, except that now we have an extra function, function capital F, 
And this represents a certain continuous extension of our function called the multilinear extension. Unlike the previous algorithm where we made parallel repetitions and in multiple buckets, here we just maintain a single fractional solution x. Now x is a vector with real valued entries in the range 0 to 1, so each vector entry represents how much of that corresponding item is in the solution. And as you can see, it's initialized to the uh, characteristic vector of the empty set, which is just zeros everywhere. And for each arriving element, we'll do the same thresholding approach as before, except that since our function is, our, our solution is fractional, we're going to need to compute the marginal gain using the multilinear extension rather than the original function. If the marginal gain satisfies the threshold, then we can add an epsilon fraction to that coordinate of x to represent taking the element. The min operator that you see here is just to prevent us from overfilling the solution. So, for example, that last element that we would add before going over capacity, rather than just ignoring it because it's over capacity, we can just take whatever is remaining of the budget and just use that as the amount we take, rather than an entire epsilon fraction that wouldn't fit. That's about it for the string portion of the algorithm, so let's move on to the post-processing. Um, for the post-processing phase, what's going to happen is we're going to take the max between two different solutions, S1 and S2. The first one, S1, is the rounded solution of x, which we can get for, from swap or pipage rounding. The second is by running some offline algorithm on the support of x. One thing that we didn't specify in the algorithm description that we just gave is how to set the threshold. The way that we select the threshold is actually dependent on the offline algorithm that we choose. Um, as we mentioned before, the threshold that we choose is very important and needs to be carefully done. If we choose some kind of heuristic exponential search for the post-processing, then we set our threshold to be half of f of opt over k. And if you, if you were to actually go into the literature and check what the, out, what the threshold looks like for the monotone case, this is precisely the same threshold that we choose here. Um, because we're choosing, we're, we're balancing between the two cases of filling the budget and not filling it. If we need to have a polynomial time post-processing algorithm, then we need to set our threshold lower. We can't hope to get half anymore. So the multiplicative constant that we're going to be using for this threshold is going to depend on the approximation of the offline algorithm, which will be alpha over 1 plus alpha, where alpha is that approximation. Notice that if we were to set alpha equal to 1, which is precisely what an exponential search is, we get exactly 1 half. So the two cases coincide in that case as it should. The best known alpha that we, we know of is 0.385. And if we simplify that expression a bit, the constant becomes about 0.2779. With this, we've completely described the algorithms that we want to discuss for, from our work. So now it's time to discuss what the actual approximation results are. And if you were to look at the, th the way we set the thresholds, the way we did it is very telling for what the actual approximation guarantees are. Because if you recall from when we first discussed thresholding, the idea of the construction was that if the solution filled up, then we'd fill up value proportional to that multiplicative constant, right? If we set it to c times f of opt over k, then we would get c times f of opt as our solution value at the very least. Now that was for the case when the solution filled up, but again, we're doing this balancing act between that case and when the solution doesn't fill up. So the optimal choice of the threshold would be to make sure that those two cases match up in value. So it's, that tells us that our approximation guarantees are essentially the same as the thresholds that we set, the constants. So if we allow exponential time post-processing, then our approximation is 0.5 minus epsilon, which is nearly optimal since we can't do better than half in this setting. For a strictly polynomial time post-processing, the approximation is 0.2279 at minus epsilon, again, corresponding to that chosen threshold. And moreover, this guarantee in a sense scales as progress is made for the offline version of the problem. A bit, a bit slowly, but it does scale as alpha improves. The, the approximation guarantee does improve for our algorithm as well. And with that, we can now update the state of the literature to account for our work. We now have a new lower bound for the non-monotone version of this problem, which gives us a lower bound of 0.2779 minus epsilon. And that's good and all, but the more important thing from our work is that we can say that the problem of optimal approximation guarantees is settled in the case of exponential post-processing. 
so as we can achieve a near optimal half approximation. And that tells us that essentially for this version of the problem, monotonous need does help, but it doesn't help nearly as much as we originally thought it did. That's about it for the high level ideas of our paper. Um, thank you so very much for listening. And as always, if you would like to discuss the work in more detail, feel free to contact us about any questions you have or any ideas you have.